there's one thing I truly miss in the world of video games, it's the B studios. Not the little guys, but the little er guys. The medium sized studios that had smaller budgets than the AAA developers, but the passion and ideas were just as strong. Back in the early 2000s, you could walk into a blockbuster and look at all of these weird games you never heard of and rent one just to see what it even was. That's how we got games like Ribbit King. It's like, what even is this? I kind of love it. But as games got more expensive to make and the companies became more profit driven, the gap separating the big and little guys got bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually the studios began to vanish. Now you walk into a store and it's just all of the big titles. You barely see any of those smaller, weirder games. It's just the few studios that have the money to make these things, making stuff that they know people will buy. Nowadays, indie devs have sort of replaced those medium studios. Now it's really big guys and really small guys, but there's something about that in between that I really miss. A game that's bigger than something indie, but doesn't have that million dollar polish or scale of a AAA game. I do feel like B games are slowly making a comeback though. Games like The Sinking City. There's something really charming about a lesser refined experience. It is kind of jank, yeah, but they're still out there trying to make something cool without a bajillion dollars and 300 employees, and that much I think is worth appreciating. That's what we need. We need those medium sized studios just to make cool stuff again on medium sized budgets. There's a lot of genres that have not really seen much love over the years because those studios aren't really around as much to make those games, platformers being a big example. So here comes Studio Playful to the rescue with Super Lucky's Tale. I remember first seeing the trailer for this thing years back, and I was a little bit bummed that it was only on Xbox. It looks super charming and adorable, and while it didn't strike me as like the next Mario or Banjo or Spyro or whatever, it still looked like a solid platformer, one that's being put out in a time where we desperately need platformers. Unfortunately, I don't have an Xbox One though. I've never been an Xbox guy. I'm all about PlayStation and Nintendo. I literally only have a 360 because I scored one for like 30 bucks and I use it just to play Banjo. It's practically a banjo machine. My Nintendo Switch, on the other hand, that's where I'm at. So imagine my excitement when they showed that Super Lucky's Tale was coming to Switch. Dude! Yes! Thank you! New Super Lucky's Tale, as they're calling it. And my brain immediately goes to 2D Mario when I hear the phrasing new super, but here it's closer to something like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. It includes all of the DLC from the original version with some minor additions and adjustments on top of that. For instance, Lucky now runs upright instead of on all fours like he used to. A kind of a weird change, but I did feel it was a tad uncanny having a character like this running on all fours, so I understand the change. You also collect pages of a magical book instead of clovers, you now have full control over the camera, and there's some extra NPCs. Otherwise, this is the same game as the Xbox version, just with all the DLC and a lot of improvements. Also, not to be confused with the original Lucky's Tale, which was a different game on Oculus, I've never been able to play that one, but I imagine it plays somewhat like Astro Bot or Moss, although unlike those games, it doesn't really seem like it actually took advantage of the VR, so they made the next one a non-VR game without really losing much in translation. So I guess this is normally the part of the video where I hold up the game and I'm like, but enough talk, let's give it a shot, or whatever stupid segue phrase my tiny dumb monkey brain comes up with, but uh, uh, this time I actually have it digitally because the people at Studio Playful were kind enough to send me a review code, so I guess I'll just hold up the switch with the game running? Do I even have to say that? Do I have to like actually state that? Like every time I watch a video, people are like, uh, full disclosure, I got the product for free, I did not pay for this. Do we really actually have to say that? I don't even know. I, I guess maybe the transparency is nice, but I couldn't really imagine whether or not I paid for the game would affect my opinion on it. It's kind of like my job as a reviewer to separate myself from those factors. But anyway, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, how do I segue back to the video? Uh, but enough talk. Let's give it a shot. The story begins with this picture book styled intro with some really good artwork. It explains the backstory of Lucky and his sister. It started with the destruction of our home. Jesus, this tone is pretty dark for how bright and cheerful a game this is. The Xbox version actually had a quite different intro. Uh, here they've replaced all of the 2D renders with full-on illustrations, and it is a huge upgrade. These look really good. There's much more backstory in this version too, so it's pretty cool to see Lucky's origins and where his family came from. The tonal dissonance is pretty strong with this one though. It's an incredibly light-hearted game. Even the villains are all goofy and fun and silly, but this intro is so intense 
intense and grim. It's a really cool intro and I like it a lot, but it's a pretty weird choice to make it so dark like this. The book then opens up a portal that sucks in Lucky and all of the villains. Lucky must now recollect the pages and reconstruct the book to stop the cats and get home safely. Right after the book spits you out, you can start playing. And of course, the first thing I do when I start playing a platformer is to see what this character can do. Lucky has a basic double jump, which, you know, I'm not huge on them. I think they make games way too easy and it's just something we've seen a billion times before, but sparing you my, you know, redundant complaints about double jumping, uh, Lucky also has a burrowing move, which is actually really interesting. By pressing either of the Z buttons, Lucky will dig into the ground, and this allows him to collect varied coins, get under certain objects, dodge obstacles, or simply go a little faster. Using the dig move in the air will have Lucky spiral downwards to the ground. I guess I'd say it's sort of similar to how Knuckles would do that in Sonic Adventure 2, but it's less fast so you have more time to steer him and get around with him. So it's a little bit like combining that cat dive from 3D World with Knuckles' dig move. Uh, doing it on hard surfaces, however, will not dig, but instead it will have Lucky slide a short distance, but doing it down slopes will have him pick up speed, which is super fun to do. It's a really interesting way of moving this character, and it's not quite something I've really seen done like this before. I mean, it does take elements from things I have seen, but it combines them and adds this digging motion that feels really good, especially how you can pop out and go back in. The movement is really responsive and fluid. I also really like how they skip the ledge grab in favor of a quick pull-up animation instead. It improves the general flow of the gameplay for sure. Doing that dive move stationary in the air also doubles as a ground pound, which you can use to hit switches and all that good stuff. And finally, we have a tail whip attack. Think like uh, Gex or something. And that's it. A nice simple moveset. Very reminiscent of older stuff you'd see on PS1 or N64. Taking out enemies is as simple as hitting them with your tail or jumping on top of them. Some enemies, you can even hit their own projectiles back at them. So despite the small moveset, they manage to give you a good range of options for defeating bad guys. Lucky subscribes to a very classic mindset when it comes to platforming enemies, having them there as simple one-hit obstacles. You're not going to be sitting around engaging them in combat for a long period of time, so it has that same platformer flow that classic games like Crash, Mario, Banjo, and Spyro all have. I kind of feel bad for these little guys though, especially these caterpillar dudes. They are so adorable, yet I have to destroy them. This whole game is adorable as hell. Every single level is decorated with these little dudes. I like this owl guy. Look at these guys. I like these pigs. Oh, and these little chicks, they follow you around if you're near them. It reminds me of Majora's Mask. That's way too adorable. There was so many times where I'd walk up to one of these little critter dudes just to get a better look at them. There is so much detail going on around here. This is a fairly good looking game. I'd say the art direction is faintly comparable to the Spyro remake. Uh, a lot of bulky features and texturing that uh, maybe almost resemble like uh, plastic, maybe not plastic, but you know, not quite the materials they should be made out of. It's got more of a bubbly and cartoony look. It doesn't look as crisp as the Xbox version, I'm sure, and the performance does get a tad jittery sometimes. Just barely, though. Not really enough to bother most people, I'm sure, but it was something I did notice. But otherwise, I am pretty happy with the way this thing looks and runs on Switch. I'd say it made the transition pretty well. I mean, again, I've never played the Xbox version, so I can't really do a direct comparison. I can't say for sure, but as somebody who has played it on Switch, I can say that I never had any major problems with it. God, I really love the characters in this game. Just ahead, oh, the names are so adorable too. Now, these fish guys are really reminiscent of the fish from SpongeBob. I think they captured that whole like uh, a late 90s, early 2000s cartoon vibe really well with a lot of these designs. The loading screens on the Switch version all have these little messages from Greg the Male Golem. He's Lucky's little pal throughout the game. A lot of these are your typical little pointers and tips for playing the game, but sometimes it's just really wholesome and silly stuff. So the game is split up into several different hub worlds, and from these hub worlds you'll enter gates to access a number of different levels. There's also little nooks and crannies to find that hide these puzzle challenges you can complete to get a page. Uh, I really hope you like sliding block puzzles because there's a lot of them. Uh, I mean, I personally didn't really mind them. These are kind of a guilty pleasure for me, but I wasn't really a fan of the monkey ball stuff where you tilt the stage and get all the coins. I mean, I guess they're optional, you don't actually have to do them if you don't want to, because you only need a certain amount of pages to fight that world's boss. Uh, sort of like Mario 64 style. You just do the levels you actually want to do. There's always four pages you can get within any level. One for simply reaching the end, one for collecting enough coins, one for collecting all five letters of Lucky, Donkey Kong Country style, and one hidden somewhere within the stage. Now while each stage is linear and has a start and a finish, there's actually a number of different styles for these levels. They don't just stick to one type of structure like most platformers do. Some levels are more 
linear than others, feeling like a 3D version of a side-scroller, much like Mario 3D World. Some are straight-up side-scrollers. They feel a little similar to some of those new uh, Donkey Kong games, I guess. Not quite like in the moveset, but just the way it feels controlling a 3D character in a 2D space. And finally, we have levels that are much more open-ended, having you fulfill a number of objectives within the level to finish it, like getting a bunch of band members together, or completing different carnival games to score enough tickets to win the page. These were my favorite types of level. I felt like giving me these fun little scenarios to play through was a little more engaging than simply getting to the end of something. The actual platforming here is pretty basic. That double jump does make getting through each course pretty freaking easy. I mean, sometimes I felt like you could just skip a bunch and not really play the way that's intended with this thing, but I mean, it's still fun even if it's not super challenging. There are some decently cool puzzles and stage gimmicks here. Uh, here you gotta figure out how to get this object up a series of elevators. Uh, here you gotta carry this lantern to materialize these invisible platforms. Uh, sort of similar to Galaxy 2, the uh, bulb berry. There is enough ideas here for the levels to feel reasonably fresh. Some of the side-scrolling levels are on rails, with Lucky running forward, unable to stop. It doesn't look like it, but it's pretty similar to those minecart levels from Donkey Kong. There is a ton of influence from older platformers here, and it's really interesting to see. It's sort of like watching newer movies and noticing all the little things a director borrowed from classical films, you know what I mean? It's sort of like the video game version of that. The hub worlds, for example, very much Spyro. And the bosses, they feel like something out of Crash Bandicoot. This was a game that was very evidently made by people who played these classic games growing up, and the passion for the genre here is very easy to notice. Each world will follow a different villain, all of the hub worlds being taken over by one of Jinx's henchmen cats, and they're all screwing up the place in one way or another. Like Tess, the gadget-obsessed cat who's jamming her tech into these little farmer worms' lives, or Buttons, who's bringing war to a peaceful village of yeti monks. Shalines, herbal chew, Bialsam. Okay, I understand they're trying to go for that whole Banjo-Kazooie gibberish thing, but I don't know, it just kind of sounds like the language from The Sims to me. Out of the game Six Worlds, I think my favorite was Gilly's Island. It's a beach setting, and I feel like they did a lot of fun things with having platformers floating in the water. The boss fight for this one was killer, too. The bosses are usually just okay, but this one was pretty damn good. This is actually one of the DLC worlds in the original, and I didn't even realize that until I finished the game. I don't know if they recontextualize some things to make it flow a little better as a normal chapter, and not seem out of place, but uh, regardless, it feels very naturally dropped in, like it's a whole full chapter instead of just being extra content. The other DLC the game comes with are all of these post-game challenges in your hometown of Foxington, and they are a lot more challenging than the main game is. I mean, they're still not all that hard, it is a pretty easy game overall, and like, I don't necessarily think it has to be easy because it's a kid's game. I mean, the Mario games offer plenty of challenge, and those are kid's games in a sense. But I guess it was pretty neat to play something a little bit more aggressive than the main level were. They also have this like dope 80s vibe for some random reason. I don't know why, but it is pretty sick. Oh, another thing you can do that I absolutely love about this game is you can buy costumes for Lucky with all those coins you find. You gotta love a game that lets you play dress up. I mean, that's why I got so much out of Mario Odyssey, partially at least. Uh, just unlocking all those costumes was a ton of fun, and here they are doing something similar. That's pretty cool. Oh god, that neck turning. Oh gee, that is creepy. That is really creepy, actually. That is just like a little too, a little too robotic. I also found it a little bit unsettling how Lucky will just randomly stare right into the camera if you let him idle. I'm sure this made a little bit more sense in VR. Like, like when Astrobot looks at you, it's adorable, but like on a regular TV, it's just kind of weird. That super bouncy expression he does is also a little much for just standing still and smiling too. The animation is typically really great though, always full of life and super bouncy and entertaining, and I love seeing all the different bosses be really expressive, but this is a this is a bit much for just standing still. You know, as far as smaller projects go, this game is pretty polished. I never really had any problems with the level design or the controls or anything, but you know. Know, at the same time, it doesn't really do anything incredible. The gameplay is pretty middle of the road here, but I mean, hey, that's all you need sometimes. And what it lacks in inventiveness, it certainly makes up in charm. You know, honestly, it sort of reminds me of playing Tie the Tasmanian Tiger 2 as a kid growing up, because it's just a decent game that's in the right place at the right time. I mean, the standard of quality is certainly higher now than it was back then, but yeah, I would say this is what the modern polished B game looks like, and that's actually pretty cool to see. New Super Lucky's Tale isn't really going to blow anybody's mind or anything, but it is a very entertaining romp through some great vibrant worlds full of colorful and adorable characters, and if that's your sort of thing, then there is plenty to love here. I'd say it's a pretty decent length too, it took me about six and a half hours to finish, but you will get a little bit more out of it if you're the kind of person who's a completionist and just gotta get all the stars in a Mario game. I imagine the original version probably seemed a little bit short without those DLC worlds included, but having them in here just as part of the final product instead definitely makes this a 
much better package. I don't even think this thing's full price. How much does this cost? Uh, see, there you go. You guys should have made me pay for it because then I would have known how much it is. Uh, yeah, it's a budget title. It is 20 bucks less than full price. So there you go. It's the return to the B-grade platformer. It's not a AAA game. It's not quite on that level, but it's what we want when we need it. And hey, that sounds pretty dang good to me. Yo, what's up? Welcome to the end of the video. Thank you for watching it. Uh, don't forget to leave a like, I guess. I don't know. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to, to st I'm just here to talk at the end of the video because that's what people do these days. Uh, Patreon, Twitter, Facebook. Oh, I'm running out of time here.